Lord, what we believe matters. And this is a sacred place where we open our hearts and our minds to truths that usually don't come at us in any other way. But I know how difficult it is, Lord. I know what a challenge it is to be anchored in the truth and to have faith in what matters. And so I pray for my friends here this morning. I really genuinely pray that you would fill our hearts with love and faith and that you would do it in a way that makes your name and your love for us just clear. And I know that this is only done through the power of your Holy Spirit. I don't pretend to have the capacity to do it. And I thank you that you have given us your holy word to be a guide and to be a precept for us. And so I just pray that your word would lift you up and bring you glory and honor in your name. Amen. Hey, this is an announcement that has nothing to do with my talk, but uh, one of my sort of goals over the past couple years is to build more depth into my life. Um, and I, one of the ways that I've undertaken that is to begin to realize that we as Christians stand in a tradition that's over 2,000 years old. you know that? And uh, most of the things that we invented and thought were new or most of the struggles or questions we thought we had, people were actually asking and answering 1,500 years ago. And we think we invented it or just discovered it. And so I've been on a little bit of a quest to just find some ancient wisdom. And that's all to say, I have been really being, been blessed by reading St. Augustine. He wrote The Confessions and the City of God. And I've come across some lectures and some stuff that have really been helpful. And I just didn't know, this is a Mike Donahue thing, so this is not a have to thing. I didn't know if anyone else would like to join me in the journey this summer and spend some time maybe in Augustine's Confessions. Um, I was just with a college kid last night who said uh, he was kind of wandered from the faith and he had to read Augustine's Confessions for a class in college, and it actually brought him back to Jesus. It's interesting. So um, if anybody's interested in that, um, come see me if you're not interested. I'm doing it anyway. But, like, I think it could be something. It's, it's not for everyone, and don't feel bad if it's not for you. Um, there's lots of ways to do this. But for those that are interested, just come talk to me, and we'll maybe talk about a little bit more what I have in mind. Again, that has nothing to do with the sermon at hand. Except for this, um, church really genuinely is a place that is really focused on this idea that what you believe actually matters. And that's one of those things that I think we don't take into account em enough in our culture and in our society. And we often have a hard time, because we live in a very cause and effect universe, of figuring out where exactly belief matters in your life. It hit me this week as I looked at the, the, um, the front page of the Sun paper on, on Friday, I think it was, and I may not have all the details of this story, but essentially, um, I think addiction to deaths from addiction to, to drugs and alcohol have increased by over 2,000 people this year in Maryland alone. Over 2,000 people this year in Maryland have died from addictive substances that more than last year, just last year. And um, wait, I might, have, I might not have that right. It, the percentage might have gone up. I, I shouldn't have done this. But here's what I do know. So it check. Lot. It was a lot. Let's just say that. And here's the interesting thing. The largest single group that is dying from addictive substances are people 55 and older. The largest single group. Percentage-wise. Now, there's many reasons for that, okay? Not all of them are theological reasons, right? They're not. But I would argue this, that there is a sense in our world today, we are medicating despair. 
We really are. Because modern life, right, basically just pushes you out there and says, figure it out. And, and for a lot of us, that is a really overwhelming thing. And at some level, we begin to medicate despair. And, and, and at some level, like our beliefs actually matter. They really do matter. And Psalm 8, the psalm that we're reading, the, the, the psalm that we're going to focus on this morning, is really a great psalm because it, it's, it's actually one of the rare psalms in the, in the whole book of psalms in that it's all about God. It's all about God, and it's all about what you believe about God. But one of the things that I love about Psalm 8 is that it doesn't make belief some abstract intellectual journey. It actually lays out sort of how you come to believe things. And it, and it, and it really touches on three things that I think are really fascinating the psalmist sort of challenges us, challenges us to do three different things. He challenges us to consider something. He challenges us to feel something. And he challenges us with something we need to know. So those are the three things we're going to look at this morning. And let's start by reading, or I will read to you, Psalm 8. Um, it should be up on the board there. Um, Psalm 8 reads like this. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic, how your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. The flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. The psalmist is challenging us to understand the majestic name of God and how it fills the earth and asking us, all of us, do you actually believe that? Do you actually right now think that the majestic name of God fills Towson? Does it fill your workplace? Does it fill where you live? Does it fill where you go to school? Is the majestic name of God filling that? Do you really believe that? Or is this something we just do right here on Sunday morning? The psalmist wants you to carry it everywhere. And he says you carry it everywhere by considering, feeling, and knowing things. So let's, let's look first at what he's asking us to consider in verse 3, right, he says this, When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place. He's, in, the, in the actual Hebrew, he, he uses, when he says look at, he uses the word for consider. He's not just looking, like just seeing it. He's actually like pondering it. He experiences it and he ponders it. And what he's, what he's experiencing and pondering is the vastness of the universe, the, how massive it is, you know. Um, it just sort of makes him stop. I, I don't know when you experience that. I don't think we actually, for the most part, we don't tend to see what they saw because when we look at the night sky, it tends to be drowned out by the ambient light of cities and stuff like that. But if you've ever been in nature, you know, and, and seen the, the starry skies, you, you kind of know what he's talking about. And I, I wanted to kind of let us think about that for a little bit. And, and we, we, we have a little video. And this video is a time-elapsed video of the Milky Way galaxy from the perspective of Earth. And so you'll see all these places in Earth, and if you look in the sky, you'll see the Milky Way galaxy sort of just blowing through in the sky. It's really powerful, so we wanted to just give you a, a second, like the psalmist did, or three minutes as this video is, to just consider the night sky. So I think we have that video, so we'll run it.
But it's interesting, when he talks about considering it, that, that just kind of puts you, doesn't it? Like when you think about that, doesn't that sort of just put you in a certain space? And what he said, what I love what the psalmist does, what David does, is he, he then uses his imagination to consider the night sky. And he, he, he basically says, they were put there by your fingers, God. Now think about that for a second. He, he doesn't say, you know, well, you know, you, you put them together with a hammer and a nail or you just sort of threw them up and saw what would happen. He said they were, you put them there by your fingers. Now, think about that for a second. Consider that. Consider what he's saying. Now, do I think that that's actually what the psalmist thinks happened? I don't know. I don't think that's what he thought. I think he's speaking anthropomorphically. But I think he's, when you do something with your fingers, right, you're like, okay, I'm going to put this here. I'm going to put this here. You know, you, what do you do with your finger? You build models. You do things that take, like, a lot of focus and energy and time and, and, and really thought through design. And he says, when I consider that, when I consider that, when I begin to believe that, what difference does it make? Well, here's where it matters. If the God... Who, could, who took the time to put that star there and this star here and that star over there and all that kind of stuff. If, God, if that's the God that you think you know, is he your boss or are you his? Are you trying to make that God that could, could put together through such intricate design the, the stars above and all of that stuff, and are you trying to say, okay, God, uh, here's what I need you to do. Here's what I'd like you to do. Or do you, do you come to God really with a, you know, like a humility, and, but not only a humility, but may, listen to this, like God has a design and a plan for your life. Do you actually believe that? Do you believe the God that created all of that with that kind of design and detail actually orchestrates your life? Do you believe it? What you believe actually matters. That he, the psalmist wants us to consider that, to think about the world that we're in, to observe it and to see the glory of God and the intricate details and then ask yourself, what do you think about God's role in your life? But he also wants you to feel something. If you look at verse 4, he goes on to like challenge us to not just consider something, but to actually to feel it. He says, what are, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Now, some people kind of read that like as a real philosophical, you know, David's like sitting there pondering what is the nature of human existence or whatever. No, I don't think that's a, a, what he's doing at all. What, what he's doing is like, when I see all of that, like, who do I think I am? Like, you, you would even consider me? Really, like when I see the vastness and the design and the overwhelming nature of the physical world around me, God, you would, you would even think of me? You would even consider me? I remember when we were flying to Korea to pick up Matt and we went up over Alaska and into Canada. You fly up kind of like, I thought you flew like straight across the Pacific Ocean, but you actually kind of fly around the top of the earth. And so you fly up through Alaska and Canada. And we, and we flew over the Cana like uh, mountain ranges in Canada, massive mountain ranges full of snow that no human being is anywhere near. And I remember just sort of staring down at those things and thinking like that would absolutely swallow me up. It would swallow me up. You know, and, and, and there's a tendency, right, to look at, the, at the, the, the vastness of the universe that we live in and come to the conclusion that it really doesn't care about you whatsoever. Bertrand Russell kind of famously had the quote that man is the product of forces that did not have him in mind. And that the only people that really can live modern life well 
are people that know how to build their life on the foundation of unyielding despair. And the unyielding despair is simply the observation that you're just like nothing. You're nothing in this world. This world is so big and so massive, and it had no intention of you even being here, and it does not really matter, right, what you, should, what you do. You could, you could be Mother Teresa, or you could be a serial murderer. It's not going to matter, because eventually this earth is going to swallow you up. And there are many people that look at the vastness of the universe and they, they sort of feel that kind of emptiness. They feel that. I, I felt that, honestly, like some people, they say when they're in planes, they think of God. When I'm in an airplane and I'm looking over at everything, I, it's like one of my places where I struggle to believe. Like, do I really believe that, that God? I remember asking, like, Michael one time asked me when he was little, like, you know, where's heaven? And I'm like, it's in the sky. And he's like, it's going to be freezing up there. Like, what are we, you know, like, like the massiveness of, of the universe just to, tends to make us feel like nothing. And there's many people today that say you need to observe that and just get your head around it. Like this world, this created, whatever this place is, it doesn't care about you. And I don't know if you remember the, um, the radio guy, Ron Smith from WBAL. Remember he got like pancreatic cancer and, and he died and he basically walked through his death like on air. And he was kind of one of these unyielding despair guys. And he would just be like, look, I'm dying. Like this is it. There's nothing beyond this. And I remember just listening to that. And, um, but here's the irony. All those people that say that are still appealing to some higher value. All the people that say the world is, you know, like you just have to just face it, you're nothing but make the best of it, they still want to be courageous. They still want to be true to their convictions. They, they want to face it and, and kind of face the chaos and say, I'm still going to try, right? The psalmist is saying, like, man, you don't, until you've really wrestled with the magnitude of this world, world and kind of the, the tininess of who you are, until you've actually felt it, until you've felt it, you may not come to this place of belief. Because here's the truth. Unyielding despair cries out for an answer. It just does. It's easy for me to talk about unyielding despair. It's another thing to feel it. And that's the difference. The psalmist says, when you look at the heavens and you, can, you say, what, like, who am I, God, that you would even think about me? And, he, and he's actually saying, when you feel that, it, it makes your heart cry out for something to know. And that's where David gives two answers in this psalm. One that he, I think he sees clearly, you know, and one that he, I think he sort of foresees. I think David wrote the psalm under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and there were things that David wrote about that he didn't even really know, like he was saying, so to speak. And I think one of these he wrote about clearly that he knew, and one that he didn't. So the first thing is that he says, okay, when, when I consider man and I think, who am I, then I stop and I think, wait a minute, there's something unique about us human beings. There's something distinctive about us in all of creation. We are made in the image of God. We are not gods. We, we can't become gods. But we are relational, moral, self-conscious beings who have a soul. No other created being has all of these things. And David says, wow, wait. When I consider the vastness, I think I'm a nobody. But then wait, when I start to think of people, I start to realize there's something inherent. There's some kind of inherent dignity in human beings in general that makes me realize, wait a minute. We have, a, we have an innate glory to us. We have an innate glory because we're like God in ways that no one else is. We are called to kind of have dominion over this earth. That's why anytime, any archaeological site you go and you find human beings that lived thousands and thousands of years ago, what are, what are basically the only things left that they discover, right? They're like pots and tools, right? 
like little pots to cook in and tools to make things. Well, what is that? That's the unique dominion nature of human beings kind of self-consciously making order out of the universe in a way that no dog would ever do. You wouldn't find a pack of dogs leaving behind a bunch of tools, right? But, but the, so David says, okay, now when I think about that, there's an innate glory to human beings and it sort of makes me pause. Okay, maybe there is something here, God. Maybe there is. I remember Pete Cazares, a pastor I really love, he said this kind of innate glory is profoundly powerful when you think about it. He mentioned uh, uh, an African-American preacher who had a profound influence on Martin Luther, Luther King Jr. I, I can't remember the guy's name right now, but he was mentioning a book that this guy wrote about his spiritual heritage. And this guy had a grandmother who was a slave. And, and he said that one of the things that he remembers his grandmother would grab him by the collars as a young boy, and she, she would recite word for word the, 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 the sermons that the, the kind of clandestine church the pastor would give to this group of slaves. And, and the grandmother would grab him and say, you know what the pastor would tell us? The pastor would look at all of us and say, you are not a slave. You're not a slave. You're, you know, you may be in a slave condition, but you are not a slave. You know why? Because you are made in the image of God, and you have inherent dignity built into you. And so it doesn't matter what the label the world gives you. That's not who you are. You are this. You are a relational, a self-conscious, a moral being, right? That's who you are. You were made to reign. You were made to reign. There's lots of different ways that you could think about it, but the way I like to think about how we express this imageness of God is when we love, we learn, we decide, and we do. When we love and learn and decide and do, you are most alive when you are doing those things because you're, you're expressing your unique imageness and the unique role that you have in creation. And that's why life feels empty when you're not loving, learning, deciding, doing, because you're made to do all that. And David said, okay, now when I think about that, I'm realizing, okay, wait, maybe there is something to us. But there was something else that I think David foresaw. I don't think he fully understood what he was saying, but I think he saw through the inspiration of the Spirit something that, that he didn't quite make sense of. Because, right, we are image bearers. Right? We are. But we also know that we're flawed, broken, you know, frail image bearers. And, you know, we don't exactly make the best representation of God throughout this world. In fact, we're, you know, we, we're, we're destroying the world that we're living in. So even though we're image bearers, there's still something seriously wrong with us. And there's something that needs to be done. And here's where I think he, he, he kind of hints at something that I think we can understand clearly now. In verse 4, and I know I'm getting technical with some of this stuff, but in verse 4 when he says, you know, what is man that you, you are mindful of us and all of that kind of stuff. Let me just look at it real quickly. Verse 4, what are we, mere morals that you should think about then, human beings that you should care for them? The actual word for care again, comes from the Hebrew word for visit, for visit. And so what David is sort of foreseeing is that the, like, not only does he believe that God gave us sort of a, an inherent dignity and he, you know, based on who we are, but we have a dignity because God is going to visit us. God is going to show up. And and so he's, I think, anticipating the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now, I wish I had a longer time to develop that. I'm just going to ask you to sit with that and think about that because I want to finish with one other point. Psalm 8 is actually quoted in two places, Hebrews in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 21. In Hebrews chapter 2, it's made in reference to Jesus and how Jesus ultimately is the one that through his incarnation and his visiting of the earth is putting earth in order, expressing our image. Again, another message for another day. Matthew 21, Jesus actually quotes Psalm 8. 
And he quotes the one verse in Psalm 8 that, if you read it, makes the least sense. I don't know if you did this when I read it, but, like, if you go back and you read it, like, look at verse 2. You know, you've got this great thing about the majesty of God filling all the earth and his fingers, like, putting the stars in place and what is man that you're mindful of him, but you've, you've made us in the image of God, and you're, you're, uh, you're mag- majestic, God. And then in verse 2, there's this thing about, like, infants silencing your enemies, you know? It's kind of the one verse that you're like, eh, I, I probably wouldn't have put that one in, you know? Like, like you know, if, if, I was, if I was editing this one, David, I, we don't need verse 2. It's all right. It just kind of leaves you with the funny. But that's the verse that David, Jesus quotes in Matthew 21. And you know when he quotes it? He quotes it when he is processing into Jerusalem and, and, and the religious leaders are trying to quiet down the, the crowds from shouting, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. here comes the Messiah. And, and Jesus says, listen, man, you can tell them to shut up, but God said that even from the mouths of babes, worship will pour forth. And he quotes, he alludes to Psalm 8, verse 2. And Jesus, I think, is saying something like, really powerful. Remember what the question I'm asking. I'm saying like when you like face your emptiness and you face that despair, you 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 need to know something, right? So what you need to know is you need to know that you're made in the image of God and you have dignity because of that just imageness, but you need to know something even deeper, don't you? Just being told you're an image bearer is okay, but like you need to know you are loved. And in Matthew chapter 21, verse 2, that what Jesus is essentially saying is this to the religious community. He's saying, listen, you're misunderstanding the nature of God. God overcomes the brokenness through the weak and the vulnerable. And the weakest and the most vulnerable people in society are the children, the little babies. But even these little babies in their weakness and in their vulnerability can understand the overcoming love of God, the visiting power of God. And so what I think David foresaw, what Jesus understood, and that what we need to know is that God visits us, not just because we're image bearers, but God visits us when we experience our own brokenness and smallness. Weakness is the avenue through which you know the overwhelming majesty of God. You know it. You don't just think about it. You know it. I I so appreciated George's sermon last week. I came into church pretty empty. And I, 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 I just could so resonate from the first words out of George's mouth. And when he talked about, listen, the Spirit of God is something that it's an overflowing experience. As the love of God is poured into your life, that overflows. And out of that overflow pours out your love. And I, I just thought, that's it. I'm weak. I'm vulnerable. I need the, the, the Spirit of God to flow into me. And I don't need to just like think about it. I need to feel it. I need to know it. I need to believe it. And that's what David is talking about. David wants you to know that what you believe matters. It does. And the majesty of God fills this earth. You've just got to see it. And the way you see it is to understand your uniqueness in this creation and the way that God can meet you in your brokenness. And that's not just something we say. That's something we want you to know. So what are you considering? What are you feeling? What do you know? They all help us believe. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. It just um, challenges us. And I pray again for everyone here that we would consider the work of your hands and the majesty of your creation, that we would feel our smallness, but it would drive us instead 
and away from despair and into your loving arms, Lord. May our smallness and our vulnerability to be the very place that you meet us. We are not what we are told. We are yours. May that truth be real to us. In your name.